I think it's fair to say the preparations have been unlike any preparations for Pacific Games previously. But that's got a lot to do with, of course, what's been going on in the background in terms of Solomon Islands' uh, political situation and the fact that these games have actually compelled the Prime Minister, he felt, to put back a, a general election to next year, which I don't think has ever happened in the history of the Pacific Games before. But if we're looking at it from a purely sporting point of view, what you're doing here, what you're seeing here, it is uh, one of the smaller countries in the Pacific, certainly in terms of those that have previously held the Pacific Games, uh, getting a chance to see what it can do in hosting a big event like this, and, uh, and as a benefit of it, getting some brand new facilities. Um, I, I think it's been... So far, fairly smooth, I believe. All the facilities have been completed, to the best of my knowledge. They've been handed over. They have a brand new stadium. They have various other halls that have either been refurbished or are brand new for the event. So uh, they're all good to go. And certainly from colleagues over there in Honiara, the, the excitement is building. The, thing, the only thing now is they hope that the weather holds out. It hasn't been too good in the last few days, but we're told the forecast for the next week at least is pretty good. Good to hear. How many countries, territories and athletes will be competing and across how many sports? Well, you've got in all 24 nations uh, competing or nations or territories. So you've got the 22 Pacific Island nations and territories and then you have Australia and New Zealand uh, coming in as invited guests. Uh, in terms of number of sports, it's around about uh, the 24 mark as well. Um, there are I forget the precise number of sports that have to be on the program, but it's around six or seven that are added um, at the behest of the country that's hosting the games. They can choose which sports uh, they want to include. So it varies from games to games. But the obvious ones like track and field and swimming, weightlifting and soccer, they're all sort of permanent parts of the Pacific Games. And that, that's what we have uh, this time around. Um, the interesting thing, of course, as far as Australia and New Zealand is concerned, is that, that they don't compete in all sports. And in those sports that they do compete in, they tend to send, um, shall we call, development to athletes to take part. I mean, this is a gradual introduction of Australia and New Zealand into what the uh, Pacific Games Council hopes will one day be an Oceania Games and would provide automatic qualification. But um, I think this time, uh, Australia might have quite a, a big impact compared to what they've had in the previous two games when they did win quite a number of medals, it has to be said. Interesting to see how New Zealand go because uh, I don't think they quite sort of entered into it wholeheartedly just yet. Uh, for example, last time in the Rugby Sevens, New Zealand it didn't show, even though they were invited to take part. This time, I think it will be different. Who among the Australian contingent will many be looking out for? Well, there's... Uh, for starters, uh, in the boxing, um, it's this is a very interesting thing for the Pacific Games because this will be uh, an Olympic qualifying event. Um, the reason being it's to do with um, the movers and shakers in the world of boxing and uh, which authorities have control over the sport and how you get to the Olympics. And to cut a long story short, the Pacific Games boxing event uh, 14 different weights, men and women games. And uh, therefore, Australia have sent uh, their strongest team, as you would expect, uh, with Olympic places on the line. And they include uh, Harry Garside, who uh, won an Olympic medal last time around for Australia. So clearly, he's uh, looking to return and go better than he did last time and, and maybe scoop the gold. So that's where it's going to be really competitive and where Australia are going to show. But the thing that crossed my mind is that I, I asked um one of the coaches, Alison Fairweather, who used to coach with her husband, Tony Fairweather, used to coach Toya Whistle, a PNG athlete who's been described over the years as the, as the queen of the Pacific, the reason being that she won the 100 metres in, I think, four or five games back to back, along with 200 metres and relay races as well. She's not there this time, and uh, neither is uh, Banube Tambathakura from Fiji, the men's 100 metre champion over a number of years. So uh, I asked Alison Fairweather who she thought was likely to win that those two sprints, the Blue Ribbon events this time, and the three names she gave me, all Australians. And it just occurred to me that I wonder how the Pacific, people in the Pacific are going to react to that, if that's how it plays out. Do people in the Pacific actually realise that Australia are there? And, uh, you know, will they get a bit of a surprise if they see them taking out events which they're, they're used to seeing their own take out from the, around the Pacific? Well, Solomon Islands Prime Minister Manase Sogavare wants his country to win 40 medals. Is that achievable? 
uh, I, I think it might be asking a lot of, of what, after all, is is a small country with a, with a small sporting base, and until recently, with not the greatest facilities, it has to be said. Um, but the person in charge of uh, high performance in Solomon Islands, um, Australian former vo volleyball player Aaron Allsop, is the same man who was in charge of high performance when uh, Papua New Guinea last hosted the Games back in 2015. And on that occasion, whilst PNG have had, traditionally had a stronger team, they put on their best performance ever and were not far short of winning 100 gold medals. So um, if you put two and two together and look at the impact that Aaron Allsop had in terms of organising the high performance structure in Papua New Guinea, and indeed that you know the influence has spread through to today, if he can do anything like that, and uh, he's been involved for the last three or four years in getting things ready for Solomon Islands, then who knows, maybe that the total of 40 medals uh, might very well be achievable. Um, I like to think that the one medal that they would want more than any other might be in soccer, and particularly in men's soccer, because they've never won the men's soccer gold medal in Solomon Island. Um, my only slight concern is, will the stadium be big enough to hold all the fans who would want to see it if they make it? But that will be towards the end of the games on the last day, in fact, should they make the men's final and did the women's final for that matter. And that, that would be a great way to end the games if they could pull off those two gold medals. Indeed. Well, Richard, we look forward to your updates during the games. Thank you. My pleasure. Good to be with you.